Here at Doxedo Bloom, we're excited about making disciples who impact the city and nations. We hope you enjoy today's message. It is so great spending time with you online today, and uh, I hope things are well with you and at your house. Um, and uh, please remember that uh, due to the fact that we are at uh, level one again, uh, our meetings on a Sunday, our celebration times um, is open and we really invite you to make uh, time to spend with the family. We're looking forward to seeing you again. Now, of course, we are in the middle of a short but very important series that we call I am in. I'm in. I'm in for what God is doing. Last week, we spent some time on the fact that God is so interested in the fact that I'm all in. So if you missed that one, please go check it out. It's on YouTube and uh, make sure that this really gets to your heart because it is so important, especially in this time that we are living now. Today we're talking about this theme, I am invested. And uh, we, of course, we're talking about money. And uh, we are talking about money because Jesus spoke a lot about money. As a matter of fact, there's about 500 references in the Bible when it comes to prayer, but more than 2,000 references when it comes to money, to greed, contentment. As a matter of fact, more than 40% of the parables that Jesus used uh, had money connected to it in some way. And therefore, it's as if we see this, this constant conversation from God's side regarding money and possessions, but it's almost never about money and possessions, but rather about our hearts and about our worship. That's the reason why this is so Important, And of course, in Doxodaya, we don't shy away from the fact that we talk openly about money. We talk openly about our generosity, about our giving, about the patterns that form our lives when it comes to money. Because this is important for us as Jesus followers to understand what our Lord and Savior thinks about money and to align our lives with him. That is the journey of a Jesus follower. We were saved by grace and by the grace of God, we are now empowered to align our lives with this amazing new life that Jesus gave us because of the work he did on the cross. I sometimes get a bit upset now if I, if sometimes I page through Facebook and you see some of the nasty comments when people would make, um, make maybe a statement about opening church again. This has been a very frustrating time for church um, and we've tried our best to operate at the best possible level within all these crazy restrictions that we experienced. And then you'd see a comment of someone saying, yeah, when the, talk, when the church talks about opening, it's all about the money. They need the money. That's why they do this. They want our money. And the reality of, of this sermon series is that you would understand that that is not true. I can't speak for other churches, but I can speak for this church. And that is that we talk about money because God talks about money. And we talk about heart because that's important to God. So when we talk about money, we're not talking about money because the church is in trouble or because God is in financial trouble. But we talk about money because we understand out of Scripture that if we misunderstand our alignment, it is us that end up in trouble. And that's why this is important. This is supposed to grip our hearts as we fight this battle and we allow God's Spirit to lead us in our handling of money and possessions. God is not after your money. If you don't understand it yet, please listen to last week's sermon. But God wants our hearts, not because it is comfortable for him, but because he made us so that we can belong to him. That is the habitat of mankind, is the presence of God. And Jesus paid a price so that we could enter into that presence and live in the presence of God and live the life that God intended us to live. And if we settle for anything less than that, we are missing the good news of the gospel 
Because God invited us into the space of living the new life. So if we talk about where am I invested in, the best place to start is actually not in Scripture, but to start in our bank statements. So imagine being in this situation where your bank statement or my bank statement would be published openly on Facebook for everybody to see. Of course, in the unwritten rules of society, that would be very damaging. And maybe that is the reason why the enemy is having such a great time with us when it comes to money, because we maybe keep it too close and uh, do not allow other people to see in and speak in to our financial situation. But just imagine that bank statement being published and other people being able to read your bank statement. And then it's almost the first question would be, what would the story of my bank statement be? What, what, what story of my life, of my circumstances and of my heart will my bank statement explain in terms of my life? Because my bank statement will tell the story. My bank statement might, might say that uh, I tend to visit McDonald's too much. And that's then the story of my life. That's a fact. I can't get past it. That's the reality. But then almost the second question is the more important one. And, and that would say, if that is the story, would that story be saying something about the love of my life? Would that story that my bank statement tells actually explain something of what I love most and what I worship? And then again, we might feel, no, I'd, I'd rather go hide my bank statement so that nobody can see it. But the reality is that my bank statement does tell a story. And it does show where my love lies. It, it shows where my priority is. And in essence, it shows where my worship is aimed at. Because worship asks for priority. Worship asks for, for, for attention. And God, He is the one who deserves our attention. Who should get our worship. And as Jesus followers, we sometimes need to take our bank statement and ask certain critical questions about what's standing, what is written on that bank statement and start asking questions in terms of this expenditure and this expenditure and why am I doing this and why am I allowing this? And this sermon is actually the especially designed today to bring me and you to the place where maybe tomorrow morning when you do your scripture reading that you also take your bank statement with you to the Bible and also just read your bank statement. You see, Jesus makes a statement in Matthew 6. It says the following, verse 19 to 21. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Invest in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then Jesus makes this statement. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. You see, this is all about the fact that there's a connection between my heart and my wallet. There's, there's something of a, of a synergy that happens in terms of what I spend my money on and where my heart is. And Jesus is saying, listen, this is the reality. I love the things I spend my money on and I spend my money on the things I love. They work together. 
And as I look at my bank statement and I look at the statement of my faith regarding finances and money, I need to ask certain critical questions in terms of what Jesus is saying here. And that is, in which direction am I aiming my expenditure? Where's the money going? Are the money going in a direction that is actually misleading my heart and taking me into something that will not be good or godly for my life and that will actually steal this new life and damage what God intended my life to be. Over many years, I've seen more trouble in marriages because of money than anything else. I've seen more trouble amongst parents and children about money than anything else. Money is like this, this minefield where emotions and hearts are all connected and it brings damage to people's lives. And Jesus is saying, will you take your bank statement and will you ask these questions? The first question, would you be asked, willing to ask in terms of every line on that statement? Will you ask the question, will it last? Why will it last? Because what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 6 is that there's a way that I can spend money that won't last. It will be on this earth and mostly just for myself. And then there would be a way that I spend money on this earth, but it will have an effect over all of eternity. It will change lives. It will impact this world in which I live to such an extent that the effect of my money will outlive me. You see, eternity is a very long time. This earthly, earthly place where we live, that we call our lives, is but a few years. This short little piece of eternity, which literally spans over millennia with no beginning and no end. And what Jesus is saying is that on this earth, while I live, I have the choice in spending money on places where it will last. What is the places that won't last? Of course, the places that won't last will be the places that's just temporary. If I spend money in terms of my comfort or my leisure, if I spend money just in terms of an experience, if I spend money just to spend money, if I swipe my credit card for something that is irresponsible, will that last? No, it won't last. It will have almost no effect. Do we need to spend some money that's not going to have? Of course we have. We have to. We have to buy food. And that's not going to last forever. It's probably going to last longer than you hoped for and it's probably going to sit on your hips or whatever. But the reality is, There's a portion of our budget that goes into the temporary. But what Jesus is saying is that unless a portion of my budget goes into eternity, I might be missing the picture of what God intended when he gave me this resource. Because I firmly believe out of a scriptural understanding that I receive whatever I have by God and by His grace and through His his amazing provision, everything I receive is of God. Not because of my hard work, not because I have a job, not because I have a business. God is my provider. And it confronts us with what percentage of what God gives me I'm actually utilizing for myself and my temporary needs versus what do I invest in terms of eternity. When Jesus spoke about his kingdom, he was not just talking about something that will one day happen in heaven, but he was saying, my kingdom has now already come. Listen, the kingdom is here. And when we invest in the kingdom of God, it is most probably the only place where we invest in it in its eternity. Because everything, most things that we see on this planet will disappear in time, will be replaced by something else. But the kingdom of God is something that will outlive this creation and live into the new creation and be there forever. And whatever I invest 
in the kingdom of God will qualify in terms of Matthew 6 as an investment in heaven that actually cannot be affected by the brokenness of this world but will give a reward in eternity. Is it possible that my money, something as almost useless as money, a piece of paper, a piece of credit card, a piece of plastic, can you imagine that that can have an influence in all of eternity? The second question would be, will this investment, will this expenditure, will it pass the test? What is this test? 1 Corinthians 3 from verse 10, Paul writes the following. He says, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anybody builds on this foundation with gold or silver or precious stones or wood or hay or straw, each work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on this foundation survives, they, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, it will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. What is Paul writing here about? He's saying that if you and I take our bank statement, we take our budget and we go through line for line and we ask the question, would this expenditure pass the test? And then he explains the test that Christ came and he laid a foundation for new life, for the kingdom of God. And people are building on that foundation. They are building in, in working together with God, building his kingdom on this planet. So one day Christ will return and his kingdom will take over everything and we will live in his presence like the Bible promises. But the question is, if I build, will it actually pass the test? The test of fire. And you see, the reality is that we're all building something. Each time I, I make an expenditure, I'm actually laying a foundation stone on, on some or other thing that I am building. It can be that I'm building my career, which is a good thing. But I'll be making investments in terms of building my career. We can build our success, we can build our business, we can build our house, we can build our comfort, we can build leisure, we can also build greed and we can build security and we can build things that is actually not on the foundation of God's kingdom. Because if ever I thought that through my own money I can build enough security for the future, I am mistaken terribly. Because no money can guarantee what lies ahead. No money can give me security into eternity. It can only be building on the foundation of Jesus Christ, of the good news that God has promised and Him building His kingdom. That is the only security for eternity. That is the only security for tough times. My savings account can be emptied in one moment. I can lose my life in one moment. Things can go south in one moment. And the only security we have is in Christ himself. So Paul is saying that if I look at my bank statement, if I look at my budget, I must ask the test, will this, if tested by fire, survive? Because the gold and the silver will, but the wood and the hay will in a moment be consumed by the fire. And I must ask myself, what am I building? Would it be wrong to build in your career? Would it be wrong to enjoy your money? Of course not. But would it be not wise to spend all your money on that? 
which is temporary and will disappear while God intended many of these resources to in be invested in his kingdom that would forever show results in eternity. There's no better place to invest than in the kingdom of God. There's no better place, and forgive me as a church leader to say this, than to invest in the church of God. There's no better place to invest money in the spreading of the gospel. There's no better place than to invest money in the expansion of the kingdom of God. Because that's what the Bible says. Those investments will stand the test of fire. So what then is important to God? What investment would matter to God? I've, met, I've heard many, many sermons on Malachi chapter 3 about tithing. And I've heard some sermons that I don't think is good theology, I must say. Because if you read Malachi 3 in the wrong way, you're going you're gonna to load a, a burden on your life. But if you read it in the right way, you will discover a wonderful opportunity and something of God's freedom in which you can live. So in Malachi chapter 3 from verse 10, it says the following. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. This is about the temple. And then God says, if you bring this into my temple, what is the temple? That was the mechanism in the Old Testament that God was using. That's where God, God's heart was invested because the temple was the picture in, in which it should be built so that Christ could come and he could replace that temple with a new temple that would be in the presence of God and humanity, people's lives would become the temple of God. No more one of stone. But at that moment in history, that was what, what, where God was working. He was working in the temple. His people came to the temple. They brought sacrifices to the temple. The whole process was built around the temple. Now God says, if you want to understand where to invest in this context, he told his people, invest in the temple so that there will be enough. Then God makes a promise. He says, if you do so, says the Lord of heaven, of the heavenly armies. I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant for you will guard them from insects. From, I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, ripe says the Lord of the angel armies. Then the nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of the heavens armies. What is God saying? He says, if I understand God's priority in investing where God's heart is, God will trust me with more so that I don't use it for myself, but I will utilize it for this investment where God's heart is. Is God's heart still in the temple as in Malachi 3? No, it's not. That portion, that version, that, that Old Testament mechanism has been replaced by a new one. Go read the New Testament and, and discover the heart of God. Because if you ask me the question, where is God invested today? It would be firstly in His Son. Wherever, wherever His Son is glorified, wherever ever we see the glory of Christ, that's where God's heart is. God is invested in the spreading of the gospel. If you want to know what is important to God, if Malachi 3 was written today, it would not have said, bring your tithes to the temple. It would have said, align your expenditure to the spreading of the gospel. God's heart is where his kingdom is expanding. When his rule, when his lordship changes the destiny of a city or a town or a life that's where God is invested and this principle of the tithe was connected to something that was that was God's heart God's priority does God still have priorities yes he does his kingdom 
his gospel and his son is the priority of God. And if I ever want to pursue the heart of God, I will be, like Malachi says, a percentage giver faithfully every time I receive something like the tithe. I will be a percentage giver in that investment area that God said is his priority. Will it last? Will it pass the test of fire? And where is God invested? If I go to my bank statement and I go to my budget with these three questions, I cannot negotiate. The fact that God desires for me to discover the freedom of investing in God's priorities. You see, we need to ask the question, when I look at my bank statement and I see the realities and I see the story and I see the places of worship and the places of love and I then go to my budget, I need to make changes in my budget so that my budget will reveal the heart of God, will reveal the priority of God so that next month's bank statement will tell the same story. It's as if Jesus is saying, we need to get to the place where our heart leads our finances and where our heart is not trapped by the trial of of where our finances is going. We need to decide. Jesus says, where your treasure is, is where your heart is. And it's actually supposed to be the opposite, that your heart determines what your treasure is. Because if your heart determines, then you can allow God through his Holy Spirit to guide you in making decisions to make investments in what is important for God. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Our hearts can be a mess. Our hearts can be influenced by so many ungodly things. Our hearts can be infected with bad news and fear. And if we allow that heart to follow a treasure, we will end up in trouble. But if God heals our hearts and we discover his heart and we allow the work of the Spirit in our hearts, we will find another treasure like we spoke of last week in the stories that Jesus told about the pearl and the land where someone goes and sells everything he has just to acquire that. And our our hearts will move to honor and to worship God through the finances that we have. Therefore, Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 4, as he says, each one must give as he decided in his heart. Who leads? My heart leads. My heart is not being led by my desires, by my treasure, drawing me down, pulling me into some direction that God did not intend for my new life to live in. Therefore, my heart makes the decision of where I invest. I love the word word, cultivate. I'm I'm not a big gardener, but my wife loves gardening and we have a beautiful garden. But it takes time to cultivate a garden. I remember in the drought in Bloemfontein when almost everything in our garden died and it was brown and terrible and everything looked like death. And then we we got a plan to get gray water from the showers and and bathrooms into our garden. And suddenly we started seeing life again. And then we had to move into this space and we had to get rid of the weeds and we had to plant new plants. And we started seeing a garden being shaped because life water was flowing into it. Listen, the day that you give your life to Christ, the living water of the Holy Spirit flows through your life. You become new in every way. The expression of this newness will be a hand of cultivation when it comes to money and finances. Getting rid of the weeds, getting rid of the treasures of the heart's desires that's pulling me away and pulling me into the temporary where I should be invested into the eternal. 
It's my heart that makes this decision. So what do you do practically? You need to take some steps. You need to look at that bank statement. You need to look at that budget and be honest and say, Lord, what is this saying? Is this showing you as my priority? Is this showing your kingdom and your gospel and your son as a priority? And if it's not, I must be willing to make changes. I think a beautiful thing is automating the importance because many times we just forget because we're busy and we forget these most important moments of investing in the kingdom of God. Automate it. Sign a debit order. Sign something. Set something in place. Set in a reminder so that you will not be overwhelmed by life and end up where your treasure is and not where your heart is supposed to be. Many years ago we made this out for ourselves as a family we believe that there's three areas in which God wants us to invest and we do it faithfully month after month I think and I will never stop believing it that tithing is one of those places in the family the church I belong that is where I tithe I don't tithe where my grandmother is in some old age home and I pay that's beautiful to do it but that's not tithing. Tithing is bringing it to the place that, has, that is priority to God for the spreading of the gospel. That's why we have church. The church is, doesn't have a mission. The mission has a church. And because I'm on the mission, I invest in the church. I take my tithe monthly, faithfully. I bring it because I know that's where God's heart is. I know that God has a heart for the poor. And therefore, I will always invest. I will always set aside money to be able to help the poor. Bible says whoever gives to the poor makes a loan to God. And God will not owe you anything. And then I firmly believe that I need to sow. The third category, tithing the poor and sowing. Sowing is when, when God gives an opportunity, like for instance in our church, the generosity fund, where we equip young guys to actually go out in schools and work with our children, where we have a, a children's home, where we have pop-up, and we give into that fund so that we are equipped to do bigger things in the city, in the kingdom. And that's a good place to sow. But sometimes the lives of people are good places to sow. To be generous in a moment. To help a friend. To give money. I don't use my tithe to do that. That is a third category of giving. Tithing in the place where I worship. Sowing wherever God gives opportunity. And the poor, the widow, those in jail. That's the places where God's heart is active and I in the invest in this. Jesus tells, or the Bible tells the story of Jesus meeting a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman. And, and there's one verse, John chapter 4, that always grips my heart. Because Jesus asks this lady for water because he's thirsty. God asking for a drink. And then there's a whole conversation and then Jesus responds in verse 10 with these words. He says, if you knew the generosity of God, of our Father, and if you knew who I am, Jesus talking to you, you would be asking me for a drink and I would give you fresh and living water. You now sometimes we get so stuck mentally on all the lies in terms of God just wanting my money or the church just wanting my money, that we forget who's actually talking. Jesus was talking to this lady. And he was saying, give me a drink. Give me some water. And she was making a fuss about it. A fuss about the fact that he's a Jew and, and that's not correct and that should not happen. And, and she was missing the point that the one who had all the living water was inviting her to enter his space of abundant water. He did not need her water. He could create a planet filled with water if need be. But he stopped at her heart. He looked at her heart and he said, give me 
something that you have so that I can show you what I have. Every time I am confronted with my budget, with my story, with my expenses, with the way I sometimes worship other things, I am reminded by this generous father, without thinking a moment, gave his everything in his son for me who did not deserve it to change my life and make me new. How will I stand before him when he says, Give me a percentage of your money. Will I respond by saying, God, that is unfair. How can you ask this of me? Or will I look at him and realize he is the generous one. And what he's asking is nothing in comparison with what he's willing to give. Don't miss the opportunity to give water to the one who makes the water. Let's pray together. Father, will you come and grip our hearts? Make this plain and simple for us. Make it practical for us. As we sit with our bank statements, as we sit with our budgets, as we so many times get confused in this world and allow what is temporary to override what is eternal to allow our loves, our pet loves, to, be replay, to replace a heart of worship for our generous, most generous and gracious Father. We want to make this simple. We want to make this plain. We want to make a commitment, Lord, to follow you in this and to be faithful in pursuing what is important to you, to invest where you are already invested. I pray this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Make sure that you get connected to this family on mission by joining us at one of our Sunday services.